Bibles to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. We've been in our daily Bible reading and this entire, uh, the last few weeks or so, we've been in the book of John. And I've been encouraged about some of these words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to start a new series here that we're going to call Spirit Field. Spirit Field. And on the screen, you'll see a graphic there shortly along with our new series that we're going to start. And I'm going to just take the next few weeks. My goal is to stand behind this platform and teach you the Word of God. I know that's hard because I want to get, I want to shout, and I want to run, but I really want to instruct you on what the Word of God is saying because I want us to know what we have in Christ. I want us to walk in our rights and privileges in what we have in Christ Jesus And so I'm going to teach you the Word of God, and over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about what it means to be Spirit-filled. We're going to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we see here in John chapter 16, have you ever had an opportunity or privilege, you know, of sharing some last words with someone uh, that you love? Uh, Maybe, you know, you were on near someone's deathbed. And you were able to share some last words. Or maybe, you know, you left a job. I remember the job I left to go into full-time ministry. I was working for a Fortune 500 company, and I let them know that I was leaving and I was going into the ministry. And they, I think they thought I was lying because they immediately said, okay, you know, today's your last day. I said, well, no, I, I've got some things I need to wrap up. I'm putting a two-week in. I've got a, you know, some clients I need to wrap up on. Then I need to talk to a few people and let them know because I didn't share this with anybody. Just, you know, I want to let them know that this, you know, is my last two weeks. And they said, today is your last day. I said, no, no, because i got a couple of things that I need to do, and I can't leave today. I've got to wrap up some things and, and get some things right. I need to tell some people that And they said, today is your last day. And I thought, oh, today (laughs) is my last day. So I was unable to share some last words with some uh, fellow coworkers who, you know, and I got to say this, some of you think your coworkers are your friend. When you leave that job, you'll realize that y'all were not really friends. So you think, and let, let me say this, you ain't there to make friends. You are there to make money. Listen to me now, because you'll get in trouble trying to be buddy-buddy and get up gossipy and defend somebody and all that. You ain't there to make friends. I am there to make money. (laughs) And so I was thinking, too, about an opportunity to share last words. I remember when I graduated from high school. And I, you know, contrary to, you know, popular belief, I enjoyed my high school years. I know a lot of people may not have, and I'm sympathetic towards that, but I really enjoyed my time. I enjoyed, you know, the camaraderie we had, and I enjoyed this, just playing ball and playing spades and dominoes, and, and, you know, I just enjoyed that time, and I remember when we graduated, and, man, my senior year went so fast, but I, I remember that the cap and gown and people were crying, you know, oh, this is the last time we see you, and I wasn't crying because, you know, I, hey, I'm going to see y'all. I'm going to see y'all soon, right? No, little did I know, I, didn't, I never saw a lot of, most of them ever again, right? The cool thing is I still talk to four or five people. But I, I remember just the conversations that were happening, and, and there were some last words that were shared. I, I, I went back to my, was in 2015, I went back to my 20-year reunion, and I, re, I wasn't going to go, and I talked to some elders here in the church. They encouraged me to go, and I went back, and it was so good to kind of reconnect and see folks. But I remember one particular guy who we thought we were going to stay in touch with, you know. I ain't, I ain't talked to him in 20 years, right? And I like what he said to me. We saw each other. We hugged. And then when I was getting ready to depart, get on the airplane, he said, well, I guess I'll see you in another 20 years and hear from you in another 20 years because, you know, we weren't going to talk, you know. What's over is over. But Jesus didn't communicate that way to his disciples. When it was time for him to depart, he didn't say, this has been good, this has been fun, but it's over. No, he didn't do that. And I see here in verse 5, pick up what Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 5. He says, but now I go away to him who sent me, 
and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. They're sad because of the words that Jesus is communicating to them. What they don't know is the best is yet to come. But sorrow has filled their heart. In verse 7, Jesus says, nevertheless, or he says, despite all of what I just said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Now, Jesus is not known for lying. So it's not, he's not saying, I'm telling you the truth. You know, I've lied before, but right now I'm going to tell you the truth. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, trust me. Nevertheless, despite everything I said, and I'm leaving, I'm going away. And imagine if you're one of the disciples, though, and you've been with Jesus for three years, day in, day out, walking with him, talking with him. He's your mentor. He's your friend. You've seen miraculous things. You've able, been able to participate in miraculous things. And you've just been with him. When he preached to the multitudes, he was able to sit by you and break that sermon down for you so that you can understand. I mean, Jesus is your champion. He's your friend. He's your master. He's your partner. And he's telling you, I'm leaving you. I'm departing. But nevertheless, despite all of that, I tell you the truth. I want you to trust me. And he continues in verse 7. He says, it is to your advantage that I go away. What? How is it to my advantage? How is it profitable to me? How is it expedient to me? How is this the best for me that you go away? And I can imagine the disciples wondering, Jesus, wait a minute, where are you going? And why is it good for me that you leave? He says, it's to your advantage. Jesus is literally saying, it is to your advantage that I get arrested. It is to your advantage that I get falsely convicted. It is to your advantage that I get scourged and executed. And obviously, you'll find out later, it's to your advantage that I'm resurrected on the third day. They don't understand. What do you mean it's to my advantage that all these wicked and evil things are going to happen to you? He says, it's to your advantage. Listen to me. Trust me. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away... Watch this. The helper, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. He's saying, if I don't go away, I can't send the helper. I can't send the comforter. I can't send you the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. It is to our advantage that Jesus had to depart so that when the Holy Spirit comes... He can be with each individual believer at all times. Now, Jesus in his physical body is limited in where he could be. Matter of fact, if Jesus was still alive today in his physical form in a human body, we would probably have never even met him. It would be, he would be more famous than the Pope more famous than the president of the United States, we would never have even encountered him. And there would be throngs of people following him and and protecting him, and, and we could never even get to him. But he says, it's better that I depart. It's better that I go awake because I can be with every believer at all times, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in the form and the person of the Holy Spirit. So it's better that I go away. He also says it's better that I go away because, you know, you guys have the benefit of learning what I'm teaching intimately with me, but most believers will not because they won't be around me. But if I leave, I can bring the Holy Spirit to you, and the Holy Spirit will be your teacher, will be your guide, will instruct you, will lead you in the way that you should go. It's better. You don't understand it now. You can't feel it now. You're limited in your Peabody brain right now. But it is better that I depart and go away because I'm going to send you a helper. If you look into the Greek, that, that word's pronounced parakletos, and it's got several different pronunciations. But, and I'm not Greek, so if I said it wrong, I don't want any bad letters or nobody correcting me after service. <laughs> it means to come alongside of, to be called alongside of. Jesus is saying, I am going to send 
me to you to be alongside of you everywhere you go. You can never be away from me because I'm sending the helper. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. I'm sending him to you. In verse 12, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. I got a lot of things to say to you, but you won't be able to understand. It would be like me taking my eight-year-old Zavin and begin to tell him how to be a father and begin, you know, and begin to tell him how to work money. And now I can teach him some things, but on a certain level, he's going to never understand. This is how you drive a car. That, that sounds great. I can't even comprehend right now any of that means because he's not ready yet. And what Jesus is telling his disciples is, you're not ready to comprehend everything I have to tell you. I'm not going to be here long. Therefore, I'm going to send you the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And he's going to, watch this, in the next verse, it says, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he ain't going to make up his own thing. He ain't going to talk about his own thing. He don't have his own agenda. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit will tell you things to come. I want you to hear this because you should know more than your non-believing friends. You got the Holy Spirit who's going to help you, who's going to guide you who's going to lead you, and who's going to tell you things to come. Say this after me. The Holy Spirit knows everything about everything. Listen to me now. You got someone right next to you, inside of you, that knows everything about everything. <laughs> Ooh, glory to God. I am not limited in my access to know what to do when I don't know what to do. Amen. Glory to God. I, he knows everything about everything, and he wants to show me and tell me things to come. I don't believe, church, and we're going to talk about this over the next several weeks, I don't believe we've really fully understood what Jesus gave us. We, I don't believe we've really fully understood and accessed what he has given us, and that is the person of the Holy Spirit who knows everything about everything. When we got our live stream going, uh, we had some issues. Many of you know we had some issues with our sync, with my words and the video, and I called some of the most intellectual people that I know. I call some of the most technology people. I'm talking about some people that have letters behind their name about what is going on. And I was guessing and I was trying to figure out why we couldn't get it synced. And I was experimenting and I was doing all type of things. I was getting frustrated. You can ask my wife. I was losing sleep. Pastor, you losing sleep all that? Yes. I want to get the best quality out there that we can. If we can't sync my mouth with the video, then people are not going to watch it. So I, and, and, you know, and we're a ministry of excellence. We want to do everything right, do it right the first time, and do it right because it's right, because Jesus deserves our best. So the mouth can sink with the video. It can happen. But it wasn't happening. And I'm calling folks, and I'm talking to folks, and texting folks, and I'm going to bring someone in, and we all along. And then uh, Brother Thomas. I said, come to the church. And I had Zai come. I said, we need to practice. We got to get this going. And Thomas said, I'll come help. And, and we grabbed hands and we prayed. Holy Spirit revealed to us what's going on here. Why can't we get this synced right? And we were just, just praying and talking. And we tested it the first time and it worked. We tested the second time where I said, brother, hallelujah, it's working, right? And Thomas said, the Holy Spirit just said to me, let's try it with our pro presenter, which gives the scriptures on the screen. I was like, well, it should work. Pro presenters, it's just a function that puts scriptures on it. That's not going to stop it. He said, the Holy Spirit said, let's try that. So I tried it with the, the scriptures on the screen, and guess what? It didn't work. The scriptures on the screen were messing it up. No one knew that. No one knew it. I talked to brainy people, technology people. I know a lot of folks. I called them all. No one could figure out what's going on except the Holy Spirit. 
We would have never thought about that. On my own, I would have never thought that ProPresenter was throwing it off. We, let's cut ProPresenter. We don't, we don't need it. Let's cut it. And all of a sudden, it began to work. The Holy Spirit revealed that. Brainy folks couldn't reveal it, but the Holy Spirit, when you submit to the Spirit of God and say, Holy Spirit, show me what's going on here. Revealed to me things that I don't know. We have not done that enough. We've, we've leaned upon our own understanding. And we've acknowledged our own way. And we haven't leaned into the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And watch this. He's going in verse 12. Uh, you can't understand what I'm saying right now, but the verse 13, he's going to guide you, and he's not going to speak on his own authority, but when he speaks, he's going to tell you things to come. He's going to show you some things that you didn't even know and reveal and enlighten you. This is our year of light, and the Holy Spirit, God is light. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will reveal light well, you know what light is? If it was dark in here and this pulpit was sitting here and we turned the light on and we saw the pulpit, we're not going to say, look what the light brought. The, light, the pulpit was already here. The light allowed us to see it. Your answer is already there. The Holy Spirit is the light that's going to allow you to see and show you things to come. Somebody say, I received the Holy Spirit. Now go to John chapter 19 few pages over. No, I'm sorry, John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Hallelujah. Look at verse 19. Watch this. Ooh, I saw something in this passage. I can't wait to share it. I prepared a meal for you. I seasoned it. This has been in the crock pot. How many of you like crock pot food? I mean, I mean, I, I was telling a friend of mine, and he was talking about that, you know, he, you know, he liked this girl or whatever, and um, he said, man, she cooks in a crock pot. I said, brother, you better marry her. That's who you should marry. Everybody don't know how to use a crock pot, but the woman that know how to use a crock pot, just forget everything else and marry her, praise God. Verse 19. Then the same day, listen to this. Then the same day at evening, somebody say same day, same. being the first day of the week, same day, first day of the week. Jesus had a conversation in John chapter 16 about he's leaving. This is John chapter 20. He has been buried. He's been executed and crucified. He's died. This same day and first day of the week is what? So what what's the first day of the week? Sunday. Same day is the resurrection. The first day of the week on the day of his resurrection. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Listen, their master has been executed. They, they think that they're, they are coming after them to kill them next. Their master has been executed. So the disciples stayed together because Jesus told them in John 17 to stay together. Unity, love one another, stick together. They stayed together, not knowing what to do. Jesus has been dead now for three days, and word on the street is he has risen. But they're still hiding. Watch this. The doors were shut. There were fear of the Jews. Jesus came. Look what Jesus did. He could have been anywhere in the whole world. But he came to be amongst his people. Whew, glory to God. He came to reside and to hang out. On the day he rose, he didn't even wait. On the day he rose, he showed up amongst his people. He could have been anywhere. But he said, no, I got to get to my, I got to get to my people. I got to reveal myself to them. And he came, watch this. And, and the doors were shut. They were assembled for fear. The doors shut, meaning the doors were locked. They were hiding. The doors are locked. And Jesus appeared. He didn't come through the door. He just appeared. That means he went through the door. He went through the walls. This is an indicator of what your resurrected body is going to look like. This is a side note, but your resurrected body will not be limited to doors and walls. Hallelujah. You're going to be able to walk through the door and the wall and just appear. 
Matter of fact, I've been doing some reading and studying on heaven because you know we're going to heaven, but we're coming back with a resurrected body. And I've been reading some things on that. And, and if I, if I want to go to Spain, I ain't got to jump in the airplane with my resurrected body. I can just go to Spain. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. If I want to go to the new Jerusalem, I ain't got to, well, where's Uber? Where's Lyft? What's taking so long? No, nah, I'm just going to appear. Glory to God. His resurrected body, he's showing us what a resurrected body can do. Jesus came and he stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace be with you. They were afraid. But he said, peace be with you. In verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Look, it's me. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Why were they glad when they saw him? Because Psalm 16 verse 11 says, in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of what? Joy. They were glad when they saw him. It's the Lord. Look at his hands. Look at his side. He's with us. He's among us. And they were glad. And look at verse 21. Hallelujah. Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. He gave them a mission. That's the mission. I'm going to send you. But watch this. I'm not going to send you like an orphan. I'm not going to send you without power. I'm not going to send you without me or ability. Watch this. In verse 22, he says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, I receive the Holy Spirit. He said, receive. So he gave them the power to receive the Holy Spirit. Now watch this just for fun. Go to Genesis chapter 2. First book of the Bible in the Old Covenant, Genesis chapter 2. Let's look at verse 7. Glory be to God. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. He breathed into his nostrils, not air, but his spirit. God breathed his spirit. That's why you are a spirit. You have a soul, and you live in a body. God formed the man's body and then breathed his spirit. You, that's why you're an eternal being, because you are a spirit. God gave you your spirit when he breathed his breath into the man's nostrils. And then what made man come alive? The spirit. That's why in, in Proverbs it says a, the strong spirit of a man will sustain him in bodily harm. You know, your spirit can be strong or your spirit can be weak. Excuse me, because spirit food is what in encourages or strengthens your spirit. So we like to, people like to focus on your body and your body, you know, you should work out and look good, eat right, drink right, all that good stuff. People like to focus on your mind and you should think right, you know, have good emotions. But we neglect the spirit sometimes. And your spirit man needs food as well in order to be sustained and grow. That's why it's important that you listen to these podcasts that we have. We provide these free so you can listen to them over and over and over and over and over again. And I know you're listening to them because I've seen the numbers. Praise God. The spirit needs strength. And there's nothing wrong, i got to say it, to listening to the same message over and over. Some of my favorite messages I've listened to 20, 25 times. I mean, I can, I can preach them verbatim. <laughs> That's how much I listen to them because they impacted me over and over and over again. That feeds your spirit because inconsistency lies the power, the power of change, the power to rearrange things. It's inconsistency of listening to the Word. So God breathed his spirit into man. The Lord's leading me back. You are a spirit, which is the likeness of God that you have in him. You have a soul, which is your mind, your will, your emotions, your thinker, your chooser, your feeler. That is your soulish realm. And because that is your soul and your spirit is stronger than your soul, it should be at least, you can control your emotions. Your emotions don't have to control you. Now, you can't always stop your emotions from coming. 
You hear bad news, you can't always stop, you know, that you might cry or be upset by it. I mean, that's, that's a part of you, but you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay at that place of fear and worry or anxiety or doubt or pressure. You don't have to stay there because the word of God, Jesus said, my word is spirit and life. That word will build you up and you can literally change the way you feel. Did you know that? You can change the way you feel. You don't have to wait to feel a certain way. You can change the way you feel by getting the word of God on the inside of you and allowing that word, taking it to heart. You got to put it on the inside. You got to put the word in your mouth. Your ears got to hear the word so that things can be changed on the inside of you. And when things get changed on the inside of you, it will drive out fear. Matter of fact, many times we try to get more faith. I'm preaching this morning. We try to get more faith, and we don't need to get more faith. We need to get rid of the fear. We need to get rid of the worry and the unbelief. Do you remember the man said, uh, Lord, I believe, when he brought his son to Jesus and the disciples couldn't hit him. The man said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. What do you mean? I have faith. I'm just struggling with worry, doubt, concern, cares, and all the other negativity that's happening. So he's saying because, listen, faith and unbelief are counterproductive. It's like tug of war. Faith, unbelief. Faith, unbelief. You know you can be in faith and at the same moment be struggling with unbelief? How can you do that? Because unbelief is present when there's worry, care, fear, doubt. Now you know unbelief is present. So I've got to get rid of the unbelief. So the only thing I have left is what? Faith. Glory to God. I learned this a few years ago because I, I said, I believe God that, you know, financially we're, gonna, we're doing well. I trust God that he's going to supply all of our needs according to, ooh, I believe God. And then the, the sooner I got done saying that, I would check the bank account. Oh, same, same amount of money in the bank account. Okay. Woo, I believe God. I trust you, Lord, to do exceedingly abundantly above all I can ask for. Then I grabbed my phone, check the bank. Oh, it's still got $1.75 in there. Woo, I believe God. No, I was, I was struggling. I was struggling. Believing God just says, I trust you. That bank account's going to grow. It's going to do what God's called it to do. It's going to succeed because I'm doing everything God's called me to do. Bless God. And he's a good God. He's going to take care of all my needs. He already promised to supply all my needs. Matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 6, he told me, take no thought for your life. Hallelujah. All I got to do is seek him first. And he'll add all these things unto me. I didn't plan on saying all this, but somebody needs to hear this. Glory to God. Get rid of the unbelief, and all you have left is faith. But sometimes we think, I got to get more faith. No, you just got to get rid of the unbelief. How do you get rid of the unbelief? Well, every form of unbelief stems from fear. Anger stems from fear. Ask yourself when you get angry, what am I afraid of? When you get angry, just say, what am I afraid of? I remember when Stacy and I first got married. And I mean, we were the first month of marriage, and I said, you know, this is how much we have set aside for groceries, and, and Stacy came home, and, and I had, now, you got to understand, I ate out a lot when I was single. I wasn't cooking at all, okay? It was eating out and Hot Pockets and, uh, and you know, dollar pizzas, you know what I'm talking about? Frozen pizza, they were nasty, but that's what I was eating, and, and I was eating out all the time. So when I got married, I didn't know what groceries were supposed to cost. So I said, this, this is where we have some groceries as well. We, we set aside a little money for groceries. She came back and spent double of what I said. Woo! <laughs> What's going on? She's like, Devon, I can't spend that. I mean, that, that don't buy us nothing. I was like, woo! And I was angry. I was like, oh, my gosh, she spent all the money. Woo! I went in the room, and I was like, she going she to spend all of our money. Our entire marriage, we're not going to have any money. She's going to spend it all. That was fear. That was fear. And I went in the room, and I was upset. I was like, my Lord, she's going to spend all the money. I'm going to I'm gonna have to go grocery shopping because she's going to spend all the money, and, and I need to watch. She can't carry a car. No, no, I got to carry the car. You know, I'm thinking all type of craziness, right? We're going to run out of money. Bless God, we ain't never run out of money. Hallelujah. Well, the Spirit of God told me, why are you so angry? I'm Because she's going she gonna to spend all the money. I, I specifically said, this is all we have. 
She's going to spend it all. What if I say something else? She's going to spend it more. And the, and the Spirit of God said, why are you so angry? I said, because she's going to spend the money. He said, no, 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 why are you so angry? Because she's going to spend the money. He said, no, no, why are you so angry? Because I'm afraid that she's going to spend all the money. He said, you got to get rid of the fear. I don't need more faith at that point. I just got to get rid of the fear. Amen? You got to get rid of the fear. And when you get rid of the fear, all you have left is faith. In Romans 12, 3, he says, God said, I have given you the measure of faith. In Luke 17, I believe, he tells us, if you have faith like a mustard seed. Now, your faith can increase, but watch this. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to the mulberry tree, be thou removed, and the tree will be, yeah, cast out, removed, gone. Just the size of faith of the mustard seed. So I don't need necessarily more faith. It's good to have a lot of faith, and faith works by love. How much you believe God loves you is dependent upon how much faith you're going to operate in. It works by love, but it's not I got to get more faith. It, I got to get rid of the fear. And when I get rid of the fear, all I have left is faith in God. So strive, aim at, okay, I, I'm struggling here. I'm struggling. What's going on? Oh, I just got to get, I got to get more word. I got to get more word. I got to No, 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 no. Take a step back. My father loves me. Perfected love casts out fear. My father loves me. He loves me. Oh, my father loves me. My father loves me. My father loves me. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Woo, he loves me. Despite me, he loves me. Despite how I feel, he loves me. Despite what I've done wrong, he loves me. He loves me. You're literally casting out or throwing out, or one translation says flushing out fear when you meditate on the love of God. And wherever you know how much you love, your faith will increase. Wow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise for that. I didn't plan on talking about that, but we give you praise for it. So verse 22, John chapter 20, verse 22, he says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Watch this. He breathed on them. So God, in Genesis 2, 7, breathed on them and gave them life. Jesus breathed on his disciples and gave them himself, gave them the Holy Spirit, gave them recreation, gave them newness of life, gave them a helper, someone called alongside to lead and guide and to help them accomplish the mission that God's called you to, the Holy Spirit is the helper. Now watch this, men. I got to say this. Ladies, if you don't, you better, you better clap after I say this. You know what else is called the helper in Scripture? A wife. They patty kicked that, but that's all right. Praise God. They received the same Holy Spirit that Jesus himself operated with. He had the Holy Spirit when he was on the earth. He was full of the Spirit. And he gave them the Holy Spirit as a gift and said, receive me and everything that I can do, you can do because the same power is now with you because the Holy Spirit is now with you. That's why he said in John chapter uh, one, somewhere in John, you read it for yourself. It says, greater works, greater works that you'll do, right? Greater works you'll do because I go to the Father. And he's saying, you have the Holy Spirit now and you can do greater things. Why? In, in more of a degree or level because it was just me. Now it's all of my children having the Holy Spirit. So he gave them literally the exact same spirit that he had. You currently, if you are a follower of Jesus, you currently have the exact same Holy Spirit that Jesus operated with while he was here on this earth. You don't have a twin nor a triplet of the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit 
in operation on the inside of you exactly the same way Jesus did. Listen to me now. I'm giving you a, a filet mignon this morning, you know, to, to let you know what you are. I'm not trying to get your emotions going. I'm not trying to make you feel good and cry. Oh, we had church today. I cried. We had church. No, 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 no. I'm trying to give you power in the form of the Holy Spirit. You have the exact same Holy Spirit to accomplish, watch this, the mission that he's called you to. You have something that others don't have, the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Jesus is the gift to the world, but the Holy Spirit is the gift to the church. Did you hear that? The Holy Spirit is your gift. You have residing on the inside of you, if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus' earthly ministry was completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Completely. So, should your life be completely dependent on the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Completely dependent on hearing from the Holy Spirit. Hearing what the Lord has to say to you so that he can lead and guide and instruct you. With the Holy Spirit at your side, you are equipped for every situation you could ever face in life. With the Holy Spirit at your side, you are equipped for every situation you could ever face in life. The Holy Spirit. Now go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Let's look at verse 16. John chapter 14 and verse 16. Watch this. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus is talking again about the Holy Spirit. And in verse 17, he says, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, why can't the world receive him? Because it neither sees him nor knows him. So the world is limited to only see, believing what they can see. But because you and I have never seen the Holy Spirit, then we must believe that he's on the inside of us. But the world can't believe that because they can't see him. This is where faith comes in. Well, I have to believe that I receive something that I haven't seen. And so Jesus said the world's not going to receive the Holy Spirit because they can't see him, nor do they know him. But watch this, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now these words were spoken before Jesus ascended from the grave. And now he's now, because this is, we know what happened after the fact, we know that the Holy Spirit does dwell with us and is currently in us. Say this out to me, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. is in me. Yes. In verse 18, he says, I will not leave you orphans or I will not abandon you. I will come to you in the form of the Holy Spirit. And so we have the precious Holy Spirit residing on the inside of us. Now listen to this and I'll end with this. You have something that non-believers do not have. You have something that non-believers do not have. You have the Holy Spirit. Stand to your feet.